I really like shaders. Honestly, quite a bit. My game, Feral North, is pretty much entirely built around a shader effect of restoring color to the world. And if it were up to me, I'd love to just make all my games purely out of shaders. But that's crazy, right? You can't make games entirely out of shaders. So I started a new Unity project and removed just about everything. Literally every package. All I'm keeping is the camera, but even that, I've turned off all of its settings so it's not even rendering anything. Next, I wrote a custom render pipeline, which just overwrites the camera buffer with the output of a shader. Just any shader. We're not going to use URP or HDRP for this. Revolutionary idea deserves its own render pipeline. Now, there's actually one very important bit of magic here that's going to make the entire shader game architecture work. Remember this line. We're going to come back to it a bit later. Oh, and it's also going to come back to haunt me. But from here on out, it's shaders all the way. Just to test that the custom render pipeline is actually set up correctly, we'll start with a simple hello world of shaders. We have a very simple vertex shader, it's never going to change from here on out, and the infrastructs will stay the same as well. In the frag function, I'm simply returning the current UV coordinate as a color, giving us this lovely little gradient. The deal with shaders is each pixel is run through this program in isolation. The job of this frag function is to simply say what color am I meant to be. Right now we're saying it's a UV coordinate, but soon we'll want it to be the ball or the player or background or I guess speaking of which, what game are we making? I want to focus on the shader and not the game mechanics, so we're just going to clone something that already exists. This is too small scope, a bit outdated, not realistic enough. Okay, now we're talking. Let's get to work. So the thing with fragment shaders is they run on the GPU, and they're meant to run for each pixel on the screen. So if you're rendering at 1080p at 60 frames per second, this means we have nearly 2.1 million pixels to render, and only 16 milliseconds to do it. CPUs are not up for that, so the GPU runs these millions of pixels through shaders, where each pixel is effectively run as its own little isolated program in parallel at insane speeds. The trade-off for the speed is, each pixel is isolated. It's unable to communicate with any of the others, and they don't really have any state. So if we're going to play a game, each pixel needs some way to have a common understanding of the state of the game. Where's the ball? What direction is it going? What's the score? All those kind of things. I have an idea for how to tackle this, but first we need to do some setup. Now, modern games support more than one resolution, and this is definitely a state-of-the-art game, so you'll be wanting to play in glorious 8K or ultra-wide resolutions, and I want to be able to draw squares regardless of the resolution. So in order to do this in a way that's easy to reason about, I created a bunch of conversion functions to swap between UV and pixel coordinates. This is definitely the least interesting part of this whole project, but these functions are going to be very important to help determine if a current pixel represents the paddle, the ball, amongst other things. Alright, let's get to the most important part of the game. The visuals, obviously. I'd like to have a representation of all the game objects, so I've set up the following structure to contain that, along with a function to register a game object. We'll be using these to represent the two paddles and the ball for our game, and for now I'll just hardcode the positions, but soon that'll come from the player and AI input. We're going to set up a little render pipeline here, first rendering the background, and then looping over each game object, deciding if our current pixel is inside any of them, and if it is, we'll overwrite the current output, which contains the background, with the color of the object. So far so good, but this is looking pretty dull and we are in a shader, so let's spice it up a little bit with a vignette gradient and some lighting. Now, this isn't entirely frivolous. I do know that we're going to need some simple physics soon when we start playing the game, and the shadows are actually a really good way to debug this. The way it works is after drawing the background and before drawing the game objects, I check if there's a collision on the line between the current pixel and the position we define as our light source, which is really just the center of the screen. If there's a collision, that means we're in a shadow and we should draw the shadow color. My physics are a little rusty, but thankfully I found a handy reference from Jeffrey Thompson. Thanks to Jeffrey, I've adapted two functions, one for a collision between two lines, and another for a collision between a line and a rectangle. These are the only two physics functions we're going to need, but I wrapped them up in a little line collides function using our concept of game objects just for convenience. This function checks all the game objects for a collision with a given line, and then back in the shadow rendering, we pass in our game objects, call the physics function, and use that to determine if we're a shadow or not. Nice, looking good. I can move the ball and paddles around using the material properties, and the shadows are all updating as expected, so it's a nice little way to visualize our little shader physics system and ensure it's all working properly. Moving on. As pretty as this game is, it's not much of a game without movement. I'll apply some hard-coded velocity to the ball, and... well, it doesn't move, or at least barely. It's ever so slightly offset from center, and that's because it's resetting to the center of the screen every frame before moving. It has no idea where it's supposed to be continuing from. At this point, I think we've come as far as we can without solving our issue of saving state. Not only can the fragments not communicate with one another, but they also can't remember anything from the last frame they ran. This means the ball is reset to its default position at the start of every frame. So remember how I said that that one line of C-sharp was the magic that makes this whole system work? So here's where that comes up again. Oh, and it's still gonna come back to haunt me. The fragment shader returns four floating point values, which are meant to contain red, green, blue, and alpha channels for our output. But we're not actually rendering anything transparent though. The transparency of the shadows is already baked into the RGB channels, and aside from that, we're really just rendering an opaque image. So up to now, we've just been returning zero as the alpha value, which is basically free storage space. I think we can be a little cheeky here and hide our game's data inside that alpha channel, and then read it back on the next frame. 
On the C-sharp side, this buffer texture is the 2D image that we're rendering, containing our game of Pong. What's special here is that we're rendering this image over top of itself, like painting over an existing painting, before blitting it into the camera to be output as our frame. Since it's being rendered over top of itself, we can actually see the old image containing the last frame before deciding what to draw. So what if we were to define regions of the image to represent the memory for each piece of data that we want to track and hide that in the invisible alpha channel? When we start our shader, we then know where to find all the important bits of data from the previous frame, such as where the ball was or what direction it was going, and we can read these from the alpha channel of the previous frame. Then, just like drawing the ball and paddles, if our pixel is within one of the regions of memory, then it's responsible for storing the relevant data in the alpha channel. Okay, future Kyle jumping in for a second here. I needed a visualization for debugging memory later on, as I worked on the game logic, but I find it actually really helps demonstrate the system. So here's what happens if we look at only the alpha channel. We're watching the memory update as the game plays. Each of these blocks represents one piece of data that's stored in the game state, and we can see them updating as the game progresses. Okay, where was I? So now we have the ability for all of our pixels to read the current state of the game and have a shared understanding, and then the pixels defined in those memory blocks know that they're responsible for writing the new state of the game to the alpha channel. Our frag function now looks like this, which is starting to look a bit like a game loop. First we check what's in memory, then we update the state, and then save any changes back to the memory in the alpha channel. Then we draw our game objects to the RGB channels, and it works. Well, the ball flies off the screen because we haven't actually implemented the game, but I mean this does prove that we can maintain memory from the shader. From here, it's really just a matter of implementing the game logic. So I added in the physics to check for paddle collisions by comparing the current ball position with its position last frame and seeing if it collided with a paddle. Of course, we'll also want to keep score, so I've added that, along with rendering a UI layer to display the score, and even AI that looks at the trajectory of the ball and moves its paddle to intercept. And that's really it in terms of game logic. You can select which paddle you control or let two AIs play against each other. We can't receive mouse or keyboard events inside of a shader for player input, so I was planning to pass these in from the C Sharp layer, but instead I realized you can just use the material properties to control the player paddle position. It's completely impractical because you obviously can't access these outside the Unity editor, and the editor slows rendering as you move your paddle, but it keeps with the shader theme of the challenge and it's good enough to prove the concept works. We also need to consider accessibility options, so all colors, sizes, and difficulty settings are available in our little game menu, and you can even pause the game or adjust the game speed. Now, what's a game without audio. Hard as I try, the only audio we can get from a shader is writing enough HLSL for your GPU to ignite, which isn't great UX. But imagine, if we have a steady tone playing from C-sharp like so. What if the shader gets to set the volume? If we store a value in the memory bank to represent the desired volume, that means when the ball hits the pedal, we could jump the volume up to 100% and then have it ease back down to zero, and we just need a way for the CPU to read this value from the alpha channel and update the audio source volume. Copying data from the GPU back to the CPU is very, very slow, but we only need one pixel. So what we can do is copy that one pixel from inside our volume memory block into a second one by one texture all in the GPU. And then we only have to copy that one pixel image from the GPU. We can even do it asynchronously so it doesn't block the main thread and our game can continue to play in glorious 500 frames per second. Once we copy that one pixel image from the CPU, we can take a look at the value of the pixel's alpha channel and set that as the audio source's volume. Then in a way, our shader is handling the audio as well. Now this isn't my proudest moment, but to get this to work, I did need to enable the audio package from the package manager, taking us from zero packages all the way up to one. And there we have it, audio control from the shader. Of course, you could add more audio sources and sound effects, but again, this proves that the concept at least works. Oh, and remember how I said that one magic line of code would come back to haunt me? Well, when I went to test this on Windows, the game did not work at all, and it took me over four hours of debugging to finally realize you just can't blit a texture over itself like this like you can on Mac. So for Windows, I needed to add double buffering. Still the same idea, but I just need a temporary buffer and an extra blit to make it work. All in all, this is a totally ridiculous and completely impractical way to make a game, but it was a fun little challenge to work out, and you could totally push yourself to build a more sophisticated game this way, if you're so inclined. I also feel like it would be a fun little restriction for a game jam. I posted the source code on GitHub so you can go through the full implementation in more detail, you'll find the link to that in the description. So join me next time when we recreate The Witcher 3 all inside a shader. Until then, don't forget to like and subscribe, and I will catch you in the next one. Thanks for watching.